Thank you for joining this webinar. This webinar is about extracting utilities and creating simulators for choice-based conjoint studies. As always, I'm presenting from within Displayer. For all the Q users out there, you can calculate the utilities in Q, but you can't create the simulators. We'll send you a recording of the webinar. We're doing a deep dive into conjoint over eight weeks with five separate workshops slash webinars. Today is webinar number three. Um, we'll be using the GoToWebinar app to interact. If you can't see it, press the red box with a white arrow in it. There's a raise hands feature, but I'm not going to use it. If you've got any questions, please just type them into GoToWebinar in the questions app as we go, and I'll answer them then and there. There's some quite technical topics. So if you get you know, confused, don't wait for the end, just ask a question. Now, we'll do a little poll to get us going. How much do you know about simulators for choice-based conjoint? keen to kind of understand what the range of the experience and skill levels we've got in the audience today is. Right. A few more votes, please. All right. Most of you have voted, so I will share the results. Okay, so as you can see, we've got a fairly good mix. And don't worry, the webinar is for all of you. In the previous two webinars, we designed an experiment looking at various aspects of job choice. In particular, the experiment traded off salary increases with an employer's contribution to being carbon neutral, the quality of the software they use, and their work from home policies. We collected data on a bit over a thousand people, cleaned the data and estimated some choice models. In this webinar, we're going to focus on three things how to extract the unscaled utilities, which are also called coefficients. We'll then discuss how to create a simulator from these unscaled utilities. And a simulator is something that allows us to ask what if questions of the day, to predict what people will choose when faced with job offers in the real world. Finally, we'll look at how to scale the utilities so they're easier to present to clients. As discussed in the previous webinar, we fit a hierarchical Bayes choice model to the data and estimated the utilities for the respondents. This is the standard output from the model and it shows us the average utilities of different people and it shows us the range of utilities. We're looking here at the utilities for the 10th respondent. We can see that they marginally preferred alternative number two. We can see that because it's got a higher utility. They've got higher utilities for higher salaries. And the range in the utilities for salary are much bigger than the range in the utilities for alternatives. So fortunately, they're paying much more attention to the amount of salary increase they can get and letting that influence their choice than they were to which column number it was in. They prefer a company that has better or offers carbon neutrality coming faster. They prefer better software, but they're a bit ambivalent in the difference between standard and great. And they prefer a fully remote workplace. Now, as I've mentioned before, choice-based conjoint data is a little bit ambiguous in that there are usually lots of possible results we could have for a respondent. We never have true certainty about the respondent's preferences. And the way we capture that uncertainty is these things called draws, where for this model, I've set it up so that for each person, I've got 100 possible estimates of what's interesting to them. 
Now, if we look, this is draw 23, if I change to draw 22, we'll see how I feel about this warming up. Cool, and you can see here, now remember in draw number 23, they preferred alternative number two. In draw number 22, they prefer alternative number four. So this is moving around a little bit because we have uncertainty. With our salary data, we're still getting a very clear preference for higher levels of salary. So that's consistent across the two draws, and indeed it is consistent across all of the 100 draws for this person. So it's something we're pretty confident about. There are some movements here, but generally the same pattern. The software, interestingly, there's a much bigger gap between standard and great. Before, I think it was something like 1.4 and 1.6 or something like that. And the preference for fully remote has reduced a lot. So just based on these two draws, we would say that the, per, the price is the really consistently strong learning here. And there's a bit of ambiguity about the other stuff. Now, looking at this uncertainty is great in some situations, like when we build simulators, because we want to factor in uncertainty because uncertainty is a real thing in the data. But often we want to do much more simple analyses and that uncertainty makes life complicated. And I'll show you how we extract the utilities in that situation. Um, we click on our model. We go down here in the right hand side we've got all the various ways we can save variables and we click on individual level coefficients and this will extract out the raw utilities see they just get that added to my data file like that very easy each of these is a separate variable and if i hover over them you can see the utilities that they've got and little blank cells that you can see there. We don't have numbers for everybody because of that split cell design that we created. Once we have our utilities, we need to create a simulator. Now, we're going to do the creation of the simulator in two steps. I'm going to walk you through the math of it. And the math is actually surprisingly simple. You'll be happy to know. Um, and then we'll look at the quick and easy way to do it. But let's see how well everybody is understanding how to interpret the utilities. So it's a little test for yourself, if you like. Um, and if you can't pass the test, do ask me questions. All right, how do we do it? We have here the utilities that we just looked at for the respondent for draw number 23. So as we've looked at before, we can see that salary has got the biggest range from the lowest to the highest utility it seems to be the most important thing. The question is, if we presented respondent number 10 with these three salary packages or job offers, which one do we think they'd choose? I'd like you to work it out. And when you've worked it out, type your answer into the questions field and don't worry we're going to walk through it slowly but a great way of kind of checking how well you understand something is see if you can make a prediction and craig like lightning has come in he's chosen option number three is Craig a fast thinker or a fast and accurate thinker? We're going to know soon. Diane, and apologies if I mispronounced your name, also going with number three. Now, if you're too scared to commit, that's right, just keep it in your head. Let me walk you through how we actually do it because the math is really, really simple. So, this first job offer, how do we do it? We'll create a new calculation. So current salary has got a utility of zero. Already carbon neutral, it's utility 1.6. Poor software, zero. Fully remote, 2.6. So that's around about 4.2 or something, if I do it in my head, 4.3 once we take the rounding errors into account. All right, so the utility we say for this first offer for this respondent is 4.3. Let's now do it for the second alternative. So we literally just, we add up the utilities. It's the first step. It is this simple. 
they want 10% pay rise. So that's 3.3. So that's already close to what we got in the second alternative. Carbon neutral in 10 years. Standard software. So if you're doing the math in your head here, 50% location, you can see that this one here is going to have to be higher than the utility for the first alternative. And it is. So we would say they would, given the choice between these two alternatives, the respondent would choose the th second one. All right, let's do the last one. So salary 20%, 8.6. So already, and we can see why Mike, Diane, Craig all went with option number three, because um, we've already got the highest utility. No carbon neutral, doesn't matter. This guy likes money. Great software, even better. 50-50 location. So this tells us that our respondent here would prefer alternative number three based on the information we've got. Does that mean they'll choose it? No. There's always uncertainty in everything. Now, the, sorry, a bit too general, isn't it? How do we calculate the uncertainty? How do we turn this into probabilities? Well, we need to do a little bit of math. You remember the X function, the opposite of a logarithm, or a natural logarithm from school. We're just going to type EXP. You do it in Excel, do it in R, do it in Displayer. Then we click on that first utility. We just do that for each of them. Why do we type EXP? Well, we're doing something called a logit transformation. This is the first step in it. So what you'll see is this X thing, taking the exponential doesn't, or the exponent doesn't in any way change our relativities, but it changes the actual magnitude of the numbers. And we can now do the last bit, which is how we calculate the probabilities which is really simple. We just take the utility, the X of the utility, and then we divide it by the sum of all of the utilities. So it's just a share. So let's put some decimal points on this first alternative. If you put them on all the alternatives, that's fine. Um, so there's a, a one in a thousand chance that our person would choose this first alternative based on the data. So that's pretty small, isn't it? Now let's modify our little calculation here. And we'll make it so that the numerator of the top bit of our proportion is the e utility for the second one. All right, so there's a 12% chance that, sorry, a 1.2% chance and they're going to choose the second alternative. Now we can work out the probability of the third alternative. It's got to be about 99% just by subtracting the other two from 100. But we'll again just modify the formula here. And then to that, as expected, 98.7% or 0.987 chance that they're going to choose alternative number three. So that is how we work out the simulations for these three scenarios for respondent number 10 on the 23rd draw. Now, we had some variability, if you'll remember, in the results of the draw when we had the different draws take into account the uncertainty. So let's just change it to 22 and see what happens. So the interesting thing you can see here is the probabilities move timely, but we've basically got the same choice. And this is actually a good way to understand or think about the uncertainty. Right? From the data, it's really clear that the respondent will choose alternative number three, and that's largely driven by the salary, which is the thing that's clearly most important. Consequently, the other utilities, we have uncertainty because the salary pattern is so strong, it's hard for us to know the effect of the other things. Anyway, now, it would obviously be pretty painful to have to do this for each person for each draw. And so we can automate that process. We click on our model and we go down to simulation, click the simulator button. 
how many alternatives do you want? This is how many different scenarios we looked at, sorry, how many different alternatives in the scenario? We looked at three there. We need to choose four. It's the magic number of market research. Now you'll recall that we have the attributes that we were interested in like salary and carbon neutrality, but we also, when we estimated the model to deal with response bias effects, we had another alternative, which was the alternative number, sorry, another attribute, which was what alternative number. I'm gonna leave this out of the simulator. If however, we had a labeled choice experiment, which would be one where each column had a name like a brand or something like that, we would include it. And so it's punching out the model. We will just tie out these little font sizes to make it a bit more readable. Now, so we've got a little simulator here. Actually, I can't leave those guys in that font. I don't know why, but it upsets me. So we'll go with the classy Comic Sans, bring them up to 16. All right, so in our four alternatives, they're identical. And so there's a 25% chance that anyone's gonna choose any of them and would say each of them's got a preference share of 25%. So let's make alternative one have, this is a job which you're just taken for money. Alternative two, trying to save the world. Alternative three, they're using displayer, best quality software. Alternative four, it's fully remote. So what Displayer is doing in the background now is it's calculated for all of our respondents, for every draw, their prefer preference, and then it's taken the average of all of them. So that takes into account differences between people as well as the uncertainty within each people. And you can see that interestingly here, certainly the carbon neutrality, sadly, which isn't getting a size chunk of the people. Now, today I'm just focusing on how you create these simulators in future weeks, well, particularly in two weeks time in the next webinar, we're gonna try and figure out the underlying story of the data. Now, when we create the simulator, there are some assumptions. The shares that we've made, that we've predicted, are based on how people chose in the questionnaire. But often we want to produce a sales forecast. Now to get a sales forecast, we need to do two things. We need to convert our preference shares into market shares. And this is actually sometimes really, really hard. And then we convert the market share to sales. And this is usually easy. We just multiply the market share by the size of the market. So it's the market share that's the hard bit. What makes it hard? The first issue is ecological validity. Do people answer choice-based conjoint questionnaires in the same way they make choices in the real world? Now, this is an assumption made throughout research. When we do political polling, we ask people who they think they're gonna vote for, and we assume that that reflects who they will vote for in the real world. But you remember from the early webinars that choice-based conjoint questionnaires are a bit boring and they're kind of complicated. And so this assumption of ecological validity is a little optimistic but there are things we can do to improve on. So we can make sure we've got the right statistical model. And we talked more about that in the previous webinar. We wanna try and deal with uncertainty and respondents utility estimates. Now I've banged on a little bit about how we've dealt with that in the draws, but I'm gonna go back to the simulator because I wanna draw to your attention that a few things. So here's a simulator, all the little hidden calculation off the bottom of the page here, which has got a whole lot of technical assumptions we can play with. Now, by default, Displayer does the simulation using people's average utilities, which are those things that we saved out as variables. It doesn't actually use the draws. Why is that? Well, one is it's a lot faster and two is, whoops, that's the wrong one. It's actually much more standard. So using the draws is a fairly new technique. And so we've gone with what's consistent for most people. Um, as the default, but you can get the draws. I said, it will be a little bit slow. In this case here, we're not gonna see the numbers change a lot. This one's showing 30.8, alternative three at the moment. It's good times. 
While it does it, I'm just going to point out some of the other things we can play with. Now, the first one takes a little while because it's got to warm up and do a whole lot of munging in the background. So we change from 30.8 to 30.1. The now it is slower because it's doing a lot more math, right? It's got to do it for each person. Now, what are the other assumptions we can play with? Well, the next thing we can play with is availability. So in a lot of markets, certain products will not be available in certain regions, for example, states. And we might want to adjust our simulation to take that into account. As we talked about a few times, answering choice-based conjoint questions is a bit boring, and so people will make mistakes. Now, shopping is also a bit boring sometimes, and we're often lazy and careless shoppers, so people will make mistakes. Now, a basic conjoint simulator assumes that we make mistakes at the same rate in the real world as in the conjoint, but we can actually tune these simulators to deal with making more or less mistakes. And we do that using something called the scale factor. And so, note alternative two has currently got a share of 10.6. If I reduce that scale factor down to 0.5, it's now going to update. So it's increasing the level of noise in the data. And you can see that all of the alternatives got a little closer to their original 25%. Or we could go the other direction and assume that in the real world there's going to be much less noise. Now, whatever assumption we make is actually pretty heroic, right? We've got to have some data to make it. What we would do in the real world, if we were going to scale the data generally, you wouldn't just use your judgment like this. You would look at some data that you've got from your uh, establishing external validity, telling you some, looking at a scenario where you know what people chose in the real world, finding their shares, and then you would calibrate, which I do in display by checking this, checking this option, we'd calibrate the model by choosing the scale factor that best explained the historic data. So that's how we would solve that normally. Um, there's something else we can do where we can do, and I said calibrate there, I meant scale, we can do something called calibration. Now, calibration is something that we do when we feel we've missed some important attributes. It basically adds a fudge factor um, to alternatives to better align them with market share. I personally don't like to do it. I think it makes the research look a lot more accurate than it is, which can lead to clients getting overconfident and making bad decisions. And it's important that users of these models understand they are kind of got a bit of error in them. But if you want to calibrate, you can do that here as well. So. Now, in an earlier webinar, I was asked about why the utilities are estimated on these scales of logit these. And so you recall, actually, let's go back and have a little look at them. You recall before that the biggest utility for respondent number 10, the draw number 22 is 5.7, and it was for draw number 23, it was 8.6. What's that scale out of, right? Normal questions in a questionnaire have a scale, say, out of five. And so you say to the client, this is out of five. That's, the person's got five out of five, that's a good result. But the actual utilities that are estimated in our studies here are designed so that we can do that cool math we looked at before to work out the preference shares. And so the utilities are in logic scale, which means that we can create probabilities from them, which is very cool, except for the client. And so, the common thing we do is we scale the utilities to make them a bit easier on the client's brains. Now, key thing to note, we could have utilities on the initial logic scale, and I will say nearly always I've presented them to clients in my life, but a lot of people hate doing that. The most safest thing, I think, if you're going to scale them, is to scale them so that each person has got the utilities scaled from the smallest utility is zero and the highest utility is 100. Um, that, that's my kind of preferred way of scaling them, um, if I have to scale them. But there's lots of other ways you can do them. Some people like to scale them so the utility has got a mean of zero. So sawtooth, you tend to get them as mean of zero. Um, you can scale them so the mean is zero and the range is 100. There's lots of different ways of scaling them. But the key thing to note is the relativities are always the same. So no matter how we scale these, the difference between Hershey and Dove and between Dove and Godiva is always the same. And it's only these relativities that are used when we do our calculations. 
Now, remember when we did all of our math, if you think about it, right, if we add, let's say here we've got the minimum is zero for salary. If we instead modify these by adding 100 to each of them, that 100 would just appear in each of these utility things. So we'll just cancel that, right? So how we scale them doesn't tend to change the preferences at all, um, except that when we're computing a probability, we have to keep it in logit scale. When we want to get these scaled utilities out, we don't have to do the math. We Again, we can just click on the simulator, go down here and go utilities, and we've got all of the different ranges. Um, now, the one that I tend to like is utilities min zero, max range is 100, if I have to do them at all. So, we've extracted unscaled using unscaled utilities, we've created a simulator, we've looked at how we scale the utilities to make interpretation easier. We will soon email you a recording of this webinar. In a couple of weeks time, we're gonna to get to what I think will be the most interesting for most people of this webinar series, which is how do we actually take these utilities and simulators to figure out the underlying story in the data? Questions have you got? Please type any questions into the questions field if you've got any. No questions yet. So I'm going to fix a typo that I saw just to prompt you along. All right, thank you, Craig, for coming along with the question, because it would be very boring for everybody if you just had to watch me edit. Um, I might have missed this detail, but when you scale the utilities from zero to 100, did it give 20%, did it give the 20% raise the value of 100 and then adjust all the other utilities for the attributes accordingly? Um, when we scale the utilities, um, we could, if we do it a range of 100, for example, um, what we would do is we would just take the highest utility they've got, so maybe that was 8.6 or something, and we would divide all the results by 8.6 and multiply them all by 100, which would scale them all out of 100. If we wanted to make the minimum zero, we'd find the lowest utility, subtract that from all of the numbers, um, and then we'd apply the scaling to make the maximum 100. Did I answer that well? If not, ask again, Craig. Lou says, are there other types of simulators? I don't really know what you mean by an other type of simulator. If you can tell me what you mean, that'd be cool. Um, I'll note there's some other kind of options here though. Maybe this is what Lou was asking about. So there's logit responder, which is using the logit transformation. There's Logit Draw, which is doing it at the respondent level. You, there's something called a first choice simulator. And first choice just assumes that people will choose the alternative that has got the highest utility. Um, and that you can do that the same at the draw level. Uh, I personally think these are completely invalid. Um, they're, they're techniques that we used to use before choice-based conjoint was invented, when we used techniques that didn't allow us to quantify the uncertainty. But now we get the uncertainty from the actual data itself. And so I don't think these rules are used much in practice anymore. There's some other more exotic rules like first three choice rulers. If you go to the Sawtooth website, you'll find a lot of their, their various rules. But as I said, I think they're largely for historic interest. Um, the But they, are, they do exist. Will we be doing segmentation, says Lou? Yes, we will. So we've calculated the utilities. In the next webinar, we're going to look at finding patterns. And one way of doing that is via segmentation. Cool, and that's all the questions everybody has asked. So thank you very much. And next webinar, I'll be back with more on Conjoint. Bye now.